unique title, the fourth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1, and we'll read down through uh, verse number 11. While you're turning there, I heard about, uh, heard about the guy that decided to quit having anything to do with sports. He said, I'm just tired of it. I'm giving it up. He said, in the first place, he said, uh, when I go there, they ask me for money every time I go, when I go to a game. He said, in the second place, when I go there, he said, sometimes they'll sing a song that I'm not familiar with. And he said, in the third place, he said, I, uh, I've been there, been to sporting activities a number of times, and the coach has never come to pay me a visit. He said, and, I, and I'm, I'm never taking my kids to a sporting event because I want them to grow up and make up their own mind which sports they like. And uh, you, you see where I'm going? <laughs> and so if we use the same logic uh, for sports or other activities that we use for not going to church, then we would be in trouble. But you're here today, and I'm glad you're here. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 20 and verse number 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God. And I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Hold on just a second, I've lost my place. <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And then we come to our text for today. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor any nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we come to this particular commandment in the Bible. And Lord, I pray that you'd make it a profitable time for us. May our hearts be blessed May our knowledge be enriched, and may our dedication be stronger than it's ever been before. I pray that you'd bless us this morning, and may the Lord Jesus be honored and glorified, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. The first commandment that we did, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, tells us what? It tells us who to worship. Now the next three commandments tells us how to worship. And uh, so we're dealing with another commandment today that deals with worship. And we're talking about worship today. I hope you came today to worship the Lord. I hope you have time in your life when you worship the Lord daily and uh, in a devotion time and uh, maybe morning, maybe evening, maybe several times during the day. You have a time when you just set aside some time to worship the Lord. But we come to church, we certainly ought to worship Him today. And uh, so we're talking about today on how to worship the Lord. We're talking about the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week in particular. Now the Chinese have a legend and uh, in this legend it says that there was a man who went to the marketplace and he had a string of seven coins and he gave, he found a beggar there who was in need and so he gave six of those coins to the beggar and kept the seventh in his pocket. But the beggar being a pickpocket stole the seventh coin from the man as well. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that maybe we, maybe America, maybe the world, maybe Christians, maybe 
many people in general have done exactly that and have taken the six days that God gave us to do what we wanted to do, to do our work in, and then they've said, well, you know what? <laughs> There's still another day there. I think I'll steal that one too and take the seventh day that God had us to reserve for him. Now, there's four things I want you to see about this commandment today. Number one, the period. We're talking about a, a period. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Exodus chapter 20, verse number eight. Well, in the Old Testament, we see the, the Jewish Sabbath is the seventh day. It's not Sunday, it's Saturday, the seventh day. And the seventh day is Saturday, the first day is Sunday, and the first day of the week is the Lord's day. The seventh day is the Jewish Sabbath. And in a moment, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look in chapter uh, 31 and verse number 12. I want you to see the Jewish character. Now stay with me. You'll have to listen on purpose just for a few minutes. And if I can keep you awake for five minutes, I think I'll have you through the rest of the sermon. But look at, at uh, Exodus chapter 31 and verse number 12. <clears throat> verse number 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto who? The children of Israel. Now, watch closely. This is, we're trying to point out the fact that it's a, a Jewish day. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Now notice that he's speaking to the children of Israel. Now watch this. For it is a sign between me and you. Who? Israel. Throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Now those who want to live under the Old Testament law uh, have to be willing to accept the consequences that go with it. <laughs> and so uh, if you missed a gathering uh, in the Sabbath day, then you might uh, get stoned to death. Right? Everyone that defileth it shall, be, shall surely be put to death. Uh, that means if you traveled over a Sabbath day journey, uh, which most of you did to get here today, uh, you'd be executed under the Jewish law. For everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days work may be done, but in the seventh day, uh, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall be surely put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Now, it's in seven, verse 17, the it there, the Sabbath, is a sign between God and Israel. So it's Jewish in character. Now, we as New Testament Christians meet together on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. Now, why is this? Well, let me give you some reasons for worshiping on the first day of the week. You say, well, I already know that. How many reasons could you list? If I just give you a list of them, uh, would, you, would you jot these down? Maybe I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to read the scripture that goes with each one of these, but I'll give you the reference if you want to write the reference down and then look them up later. Why do we meet on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week? Well, number one, Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day, Mark 16, 9. He was resurrected on the first day of the week. Number two, we meet on the Lord's Day because Jesus met with his disciples on the first day of the week. Mark 16, 11. Number three, Jesus met with his disciples, imparted the Holy Spirit, and gave the great commission and ascended into heaven on the first day. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. Number four, we worship on the Lord's Day, meet together on the Lord's Day. Why? Number four, because Pentecost was on the first day. That day when they had all of those souls saved and they had all of that crowd of people gathered together there, uh, the, the apostles preached on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came on that day, Acts chapter 2. Number five, the Bible was completed on the first day. Some of you are looking at me like, huh? <laughs> yeah, how do, I, how do I know that? Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 10. 
The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation and as he's closing out the Bible, here's what he says. As he gives the vision that God gave to him, the vision of the Lord Jesus and the things that he told him to write down in the book of Revelation, here's what it says in Revelation 1.10. John is speaking. John uh, the Apostle says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Ah, that's good. Number six. The early church met for worship on the first day. Acts chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. The early church, church met for worship on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Number seven, collections were taken and received on the first day. That's when they had their offerings. It would be hard. Wouldn't it be hard to take an offering if everybody wasn't together? Huh? Well, sometimes it's hard to take one when they are together, but, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way they would take their offerings. In the Bible, they gathered together for preaching and for fellowship and for breaking of bread, and that's the day they took the offerings. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 2. So what's some differences then between the, between the Sabbath day and the Lord's day? Some differences. Well, this is a, a time of glorious transition. Going over from the Old Testament law under uh, the New Testament uh, system of worship under grace, the church. Now, let me, let me just give you some, I'll just spit these out and if you want to jot them down, you can. But this is just, an, I'll give you another little list. and Everything's not going to be a list today, so just relax. But this is a transition time. The Old Testament Sabbath day celebrated the finished work of creation. The Lord's day commemorates the finished work of redemption, the resurrection. The Sabbath day, the seventh day, commemorating, commemorated the beginning of life when God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, he created everything and on the seventh day he did what? He rested. And so the seventh day in the Old Testament is a commemoration of the resting and the beginning of natural creation. Well, the Lord's Day celebrates the beginning of supernatural life. The first day, I mean the, the uh, celebration of the Old Testament Sabbath, celebrates the life we, that we had back then in Adam. The New Testament time, the Lord's Day, celebrates life in Christ. The Sabbath day celebrated the work of God's hand, but the New Testament, the first day of the week, when we meet together as a church, that celebrates God's heart. The Old Testament celebrated the display of power. New Testament day celebrates the display of God's grace. Those are some differences. Well, and of course the main one was that the Old Testament Sabbath was given to Israel and the New Testament day, the Lord's day, was given to the church. And I'm grateful we've got that day. Now there's some, there's some folks that, that, uh, that claim to be Christian today that celebrate and worship and meet together on the seventh day. I mean, you've got Seventh-day Adventists, you've even got Seventh-day Baptists and a lot of other Seventh-day people. They call them Sabbatarians. And uh, it seems to me that, that the Sabbatarians just are living on the wrong side of Calvary and need to get on the right side. Now... Now, just in case you think we have not a basis for saying this, look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 14. I wish you'd just turn there because this one, this one shows clearly the transition and the change. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 14. This, the Bible there speaks of Christ who by his death blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That is the Old Testament ceremonial law, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, look at this, nailing it to his cross. Hey, the Old Testament Sabbath was one of those things that the, that the Lord nailed to the cross. We don't have to follow in the church because that was a sign between God and Israel. Now look at verse number 16 in, in Colossians there. Look at number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of and... Next word. A holy day. So the other one just quit on me. Okay. A holy day. Or of new moons. Or of the, what's that word? Sabbath days. Now literally, a Sabbath day. Which means that 
Well, let's just read down. Which are a shadow of things to come. So what was the Sabbath day? What's the Sabbath day to us? The Sabbath day is simply a shadow in the Old Testament of the real thing, the thing of substance in the New Testament. And what is that? What is the shadow of what? Of Jesus Christ. And Jesus has Come. And so instead of having the shadow now of the Old Testament Sabbath, we have the real thing. We have Jesus Christ. So that's the period. Now, number two, the principle. The principle here. Go back to Exodus chapter number 20, if you will, and we want to see the principle. And there's uh, s- several things, several things there. But one of, the prin- one of the principles that we want to notice is the principle of work. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse number 9. Six days shalt thou... What? Labor. Now that's a command. Six day, look at, do you see the sentence structure there? Six days work if you want to. No, he says, six days shalt thou labor. Six days shalt thou labor. And the same Bible that commands us to rest is the same Bible that commands us to work. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Yeah, he tells us we ought to rest, but he also tells us that we ought to work. And uh, all, all work is, uh, is spiritual for us because he's commanded us to work. It's a spiritual thing to work. And it's, a, and it's a working thing to worship. When we worship, you have to work at it. It's not something we can do passively. I mean, if, you're just, if you just come into church and, uh, and as Brother Paul said in the Sunday school lesson, all you do is look at your fingernails <laughs> and twiddle your thumbs, you may not get much out of it. But if you come to church working at worshiping, then you'll get something out of it. And so think about Jesus Christ himself. He was born into a home that worked. Joseph was a carpenter. Jesus learned to work. That's why we call him the carpenter. And uh, he was born into the home of a working man. And Jesus himself knew how to work. He knew how to use his hands, whether he was using his hands to build furniture or whether he was using his hands to heal the sick. He was working. Everything we do for the Christian, everything that we do is an intermix of worship and work. Now, the man or woman who is not willing to work, the Bible indicates that they're not willing to live or not worthy to live. And that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. We'll look at that in just a little bit. But we're not talking about, now listen, the Bible teaches that we ought to work. I've got to get a, I gotta get a microphone. I'm going to get that red one. The Bible teaches that we ought to work. And so we're not talking about we're not talking about people who cannot work. See, that's that's what uh, we get accused of when we when we speak about working today. Uh, sometimes people say, Well, there's just some people that's not able to work. We recognize that. And that's I'm not against taking care of people that can't work, are you? People that are in, in so ill of health or they have uh, maybe they put in their lifetime of working and there's, they're at the age now where they're not able to work. And there's reasons why sometimes people can't work. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about people who won't work. Are you with me? And so look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10. There it teaches this. If a man will not work, what does it say? Neither should he Eat. (laughs) You know what it is? (laughs) According to the Bible, it is a sin to keep feeding people who will not work. It's a sin to continue to feed people who will not work. Hello? Don't leave me all alone up here. (laughs) I'm telling you the Bible truth teaches that people ought to work and people who are not willing to work uh, shouldn't be fed. Now, you say, well, preacher, you just don't have any compassion. Before you accuse me of that, I, I, I took a man out this week. I had a call, and I, I suspected when I had the call that I was dealing with probably somebody who uh, maybe was pull, trying to pull the wool over my eyes a little bit, said he, hadn't, he, he needed uh, transportation, he needed money, he needed lots of stuff, and so it came down to it. 
I had enough money in my billfold I could buy him something to eat and I took him uh, met him at the hospital took him upstairs to the cafeteria and I didn't eat but I bought him a full meal I mean a big meal and I fed him and I, I asked him some questions that revealed to me that he was truly pulling the wool over my eyes so I wasn't going to give him anything extra but I did buy him a meal so just letting you know that so you don't think I'm hard hearted okay I mean look at this face do I look hard hearted <laughs> don't amen me right there <laughs> um, there's, today there's a lot of people without work there's some people that are without work right now who would like to have a job and can't find one and that's true and, uh, and as long as they're looking for work, then that's okay. But as a country, I'm talking about as a way our country operates, our country has gone insane. And you've got a lot of, lot of soft-hearted, no, we've got a lot of soft-headed people in our country who want to take and give you who do work to take your money and give it to people who just simply refuse to work. And that's a wrong-headed philosophy to have. Our nation cannot continue to go that way. When you take money away from people who will work and give it to people who simply do not want to work, then that kills the morale on the people who do want to work, and they'll join the ones who won't work. Does that make sense? We live in a nation today when we are about half of the people in our country are on welfare. 11 states now, 11 states, thank goodness Arkansas, as far as I know right now, is not one of them, but there are 11 states, of which you would guess New York and California would be one of them, 11 states now where over 60% of the population is on welfare. Friend, there's not that many sick people. There's that, not that many disabled people. There are that many people who have decided that as long as the government's going to hand it out, they'll take it. And they won't work. And if you're willing to pay for it, they'll let you. And so the Bible teaches that we ought to work. Brother Al sitting here. Brother Al, uh, how old were you when you had that accident? <laughs> he told me a while ago he's accident prone. <laughs> he was 39. He was a lineman on elect for an electric company. And on a stormy night, trying to trying to work with electrical lines fell and, and, and his neck fell across an electrical line and it about burned his head completely off of his shoulders it just it burned across his neck he's got a huge wound there and, uh, and if you've noticed brother Al shakes a little bit that's cause he does drugs no I'm just <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> no I'm teasing he does, he does that because of that huge voltage that he got he was in the hospital for weeks and weeks and a few months really wasn't it and uh and almost didn't survive you know by all odds he probably should have died but somehow he stayed alive and uh guess what if anybody ought to be disabled and refuse to work you know a guy that's almost been beheaded besides that falling off a ladder and breaking his back and a few other things after that He's held down a job, retired from working for the city, city parks, driving school buses, and uh, is about to do some of that again, yard work, everything. He's still willing to work. Man, I'm sure he wouldn't have to, but you know what he's got? He's got a work ethic. And we've got other people. That Brother Danny retired from a job, worked there 20, 30 years? 37 years? Wow, that's too long to work at one place. <laughs> He worked 37 years at one place and retired from there. And now he gets out there with his bad back. Pray for him. He's got to have surgery Wednesday on his back. And, uh, but he gets out there and rides these dumb lawnmowers around and still works. Right up till surgery time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are people who have a work ethic. And there's many of you sitting here that, that, that work. And thank God for it. Uh, that's what the Bible commands, that we ought to be willing to work. When you were a child, you probably heard the story of the little red hen, didn't you? The little red hen? I have a variation of it for you. Listen to this. This is the modern little red hen. Once upon a time, there was a little red hen who scratched about in the barnyard until she discovered some grains of wheat. 
She called on, on her neighbors and said, If we plant this wheat, we shall have bread to eat. Who will help me plant it? Not I, said the cow. Not I, said the duck. Not, nor I, said the pig. Not I, said the goose. Then I will, said the little red hen. And she did. And the wheat grew tall and ripened to golden grain. And Then she said, Who will help me reap my wheat? Asked the little red hen. Not I, said the duck. Out of my classification, said the pig. I'd lose my seniority, said the cow. I'd lose my unemployment compensation, said the goose. Then I will, said the little red hen. And she did. At last came time to bake the bread. Who will help me bake the bread? Who will help me bake the bread, asked the little red hen. Oh, that would be overtime for me, said the cow. I'd lose my welfare benefits, said the duck. I'm a dropout and have never learned how, said the pig. If I'm to be the only helper, that's discrimination, said the goose. Then I will, said the little red hen. She baked five loaves and held them up for her neighbors to see. They all wanted some and, in fact, demanded a share. But the little red hen said, no, I can eat the five loaves all by myself. But wait, the story doesn't end there. Excess profits, cried the cow. Capitalistic leech, screamed the duck. I demand equal rights, yelled the goose, and the pig just grunted. And they painted unfair picket signs and marched round and round the little red hen shouting, shouting obscenities. When the government agent came, he said to the little red hen, you must not be greedy. But I earned the bread, said the little red hen. Exactly, said the agent. That's the wonderful free enterprise system. Anybody in the barnyard can have as much as he wants. But under our modern government regulations, the productive workers must divide their product with the idle. Well, they continued to live, including the little red hen, who smiled and clucked. But her neighbors wondered why she never baked any more bread. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Six days shalt thou work. So we have there the, the principle of work. Then we have the principle of worship. Now watch this one. The principle of worship. The Lord has ordained that we should worship him. Isn't that true? But why? Well, there's three reasons I want to give you for having one day of rest in worship. Why is it that we need? Why in the world do we need to just not go to work on Sunday, on the first day of the week? Why is it that we need to come to church? Why is it that we need to worship the Lord? Well, number one, to replenish your spirit. Just like a battery your spiritual nature will run down and get low. It's got to get recharged. And you need that one day of worship in the Lord's house on Sunday to recharge your battery. Back in the olden days, there was a man in Philadelphia who walked by uh, a pasture and he knew the man that owned the mules, had these mules working in the coal mines all through the week and he saw the mules out in the pasture on Sunday. And so the man stopped and asked the farmer, he said, uh, how come you keep those uh, mules out of the coal mines on Sunday? The wise old farmer said, you know, I've learned this. If you take those mules down there in that mine and keep them all week, seven days, seven days, seven days, they'll go blind. They need that one day back up on top in the sunlight. You know what? People are the same way. We need that one day. We need that one day where we worship the Lord and where, where we get close to Him and recharge our batteries again. We can't go out there and hit it seven days, seven days, seven days. Just can't do it. We're not built that way. God made us a certain way and God made us to worship Him and we need one day in order to get that done. Number two, to refresh your soul. You see, not only does man have a spirit that must commune with God, but we also have a mind, a soul, a psyche, and that mind needs to be refreshed. And it takes a day to get it refreshed. I mean, uh, you just we live in a we live in a society. People say, "Man, I think I'll move to Arkansas and enjoy that laid-back lifestyle." 
Have any of you discovered it yet? <laughs> I've been looking for it and hadn't found it. <laughs> but uh, I say it, you're just about as busy here as you would be up north or anywhere else. And uh, we need some rest for the mind. The, one of the first things the doctor does when people comes to the, come to the doctor now and say, boy, I just feel run down. I just don't seem to have the will to do anything, and I'm just having problems. And one of the first things the doctor does now is offer you some stress relief in the form of a res prescription because you're just too stretched out. Stress, stressed out and stretched out. And why do we get that way? How come we're that way? Because we're going. We're going constantly. We're going here, going there. And we're trying to earn a living. We're trying to raise kids. We're trying to, we're trying to be faithful to church. We're trying to do the things we got to do. Trying to take care, keep the yard mowed. Trying to do the things at home and cleaning the house and, and keeping the vehicles going. And Man, you got to work in a fishing day every once in a while, right? <laughs> and as we even work at fishing anymore. I mean, everything we do is seemed like we just rush, rush, rush. Adrian Rogers said that three words would describe today's society. Hurry, worry, and bury. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Well, we seem like we're in a hurry, but we don't know where we're going. <laughs> when I was 16 years old, I, was, I went out to Washington State to make my fortune working in the fruit orchards. <laughs> and now my parents should have never have let me let me go and I'm, I'm not kidding you but uh, they did and so I, I lived with my aunt and my cousin and uh, cousins and uh, and there were some other folks we were sharing a big house there in the orchard that was given to us free to work for the guy that owned the orchard and uh, and my cousin Linda she was the same age as me uh, she slept with her mother in another room, and I, I had a room on the very end of the house, on a two-story house. And, and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night one night. I heard the awfulest yelling and hollering going on, and I thought, what in the world? Somebody's broke into our house, and they're attacking my cousin and my aunt. And so, man, I come charging through the door into their bedroom, and, and uh, Linda, my cousin, she's up on the mattress on the bed, and she's running like this in her nightgown. She's trying to run, and her mother's got her by the t tail of her nightgown trying to hold her back, and she's running, and she's holding her back, and she's running in place. Linda always walked in her sleep, and she was having a race in her sleep, and she was about to run off the foot of the bed, and her mother was hanging on to her. And I, I thought, that's the way a lot of Christians are today. That's the way a lot of people are. We're running and getting nowhere. I mean, we're, we're as bad as it was. I told you about when the, I was trying to move my honeybees that night and I was loading them on the trailer. And, and Brother Jerry, I, I, had my, I had the cart getting them up on the trailer and uh, had about three or four boxes of those bees all stacked up there. And, and somehow when I was getting them up on the trailer, that stack of bees twisted and left a gap in there and a whole cloud of those bees. And this is nighttime and bees don't night, like to be fooled with at night. And when you've got a headlight on, bees are like other bugs. They go to the light. So here comes this cloud of bees out, and they're all over. I got a bee suit on, I got a veil on, but man, they're all over me. And at nighttime, their stingers evidently are longer because they were stinging me through my suit. And they're stinging me all over. And I'm and and I know, look, one of the first things you learn as a beekeeper is you can't outrun bees. But I had to run anyway. <laughs> I took off. I thought, man, if I can just get away from these guys. So I'm running through the orchard. I'm going in circles, running around, and there's trees, and there's bees are just cloud around me, and I'm going under limbs and trying to brush them off as I go under the limbs, thinking maybe, maybe they'll get lost in these tree limbs or something, and I run and run and run. Can't get rid of them. I finally run all the way from the orchard up to the house, <laughs> and about that time, I notice there's about four or five half a dozen bees inside my veil, inside my veil. I just have one good eye. I can't see out of my right eye. And I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> Those bees are inside my veil, and if one of them stings my good eye, then I'm not going to be able to see at all. And so I, started run I did the only sensible thing to do. I started running around the house in a circle. <laughs> I ran around and around and around that house. I don't know where I was going. 
I didn't have any place I needed to go. I just wanted to be running. <laughs> I mean, you got bees, and you heard of having a bee in your bonnet? I had it. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do about it. And finally, I'm running around the house, and I'm thinking, maybe, just maybe, if I pull this, if I unzip this thing and throw it off, then I'll get rid of the bees inside the veil. But when I throw it off, that other cloud of bees that's following me is going to nail me. So what do I do? So I ran around the house until, I was, as I was thinking things through, <laughs> I might as well have been sitting down. It would have been a lot easier. And they just still, they sting me just as easy running as they can sitting still. So finally I decided I was going to get, next time I pass that patio door, I'm going to throw that veil off and run through the patio door. <laughs> well, I did go inside and about a dozen bees followed me. And my wife was so thankful. I felt like an idiot running from bees because you can't outrun them. You know what? We live in a day where people are just running and they feel some kind of pain they feel some kind of discomfort and they feel like there's something pressuring them to do something but we're getting nowhere we need that day of worship to unwind and get our minds rested up again some American explorers went to Africa and they hired some of the natives to accompany them and help carry the, the uh, supplies and so forth they went, they were just going, 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 night and day. And uh, on the seventh day, the natives just sat down. They'd been working hard six days. On the seventh day, they sat down. And the American explorer said, man, we can't afford to sit down. We need to be moving. And the natives said this. They said, we no go today. We rest today and let our souls catch up with our bodies. You know what a lot of people need to do? They need this worship day to let their soul catch up with their body third thing how to we do it to rest our body not only our spirit our mind but our body needs rest worship is rest Isaiah 40 31 says they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength now there's something about taking time to sharpen your axe that helps and our body needs rest and we need to take the time to give that day back to the Lord and there's somehow you know let me give you a little example we who have been saved for a while and have learned to tithe uh, the Bible teaches tithing which is giving the first 10 percent of your gross income to the Lord because the Bible does say the tithe is the Lord's. The amens are deafening in here. <laughs> the tithe is the Lord's. Um, and somehow we've discovered, those who tithe, you've discovered that you can do more with 90% than you can with 100%. Huh? When you give the Lord His 10%, somehow the Lord stretches that out that 90% will go further than the 100% would have if you'd have kept God's 10%. It's okay to say amen. I mean, if your neighbor doesn't believe in tithing next to you, they'll get over it. <laughs> but wait a minute. Let's take that same principle and apply it to our seven days that we have in a week. If you take a day and give it to the Lord, you give the first day of the week to the Lord to meet at church those other six days will be more productive than seven days would have been if you took the Lord's day and kept it for yourself to work now think about it it works with your money it works with your time well let me num big number three I've got to I got to give you these quickly the practice we talked about the period uh, we as Christians worship on the first day of the week we've talked about the principle there's work and worship involved and then the practice well the Old Testament practice was that you had to keep the Sabbath day you had to keep the Sabbath day out of necessity and the Jews the Jews had a list of rules that 
<laughs> they made up a list of rules. It wasn't biblical, but they made up a list of rules about the Sabbath day. Now listen to this. They had their little rule book. They had, they had come up with 15 ways that a man could break the Sabbath. Uh, if you got a... If your chicken laid an egg on Saturday, you couldn't eat it. Why? Well, that chicken was working on Saturday, <laughs> and so you couldn't eat that egg. If you got a tack in your shoe, and you had to stop and take it out, you were working, because you, couldn't, you weren't allowed to take that tack out of your shoe on the Sabbath day. Now, you could... Uh, <coughs> You could swallow vinegar, but if you had a toothache, you couldn't hold it in your mouth because that was healing on the Sabbath. You couldn't heal on the Sabbath. If a flea happened to decide to bite you, you just had to let him gnaw on you because hunting wasn't allowed on the Sabbath. <laughs> they just had all these rules. and No fire could be kindled on the Sabbath. I mean, it, it didn't matter how cold you were. <laughs> You couldn't build a fire. And uh, they just had every. If the ox fell in the ditch, you were allowed to get the ox out. But if a man fell in the ditch, he just had to stay there. I mean, this is just kind of the rules they made up. I mean, they, they, it was rule keeping. And God didn't mean for us to live this way. The New Testament practice on the Lord's Day, it's not a day of gloom, but it's a day of grace. It's not a day when we regret, but we rejoice. And, uh, and the, the Sabbath day is just Old Testament, and we are not to live in it. Let me give you my last one, number four, the prophecy. The prophecy. We read there in Colossians 2, 16 and 17 that the Sabbath days are a shadow of Christ. Remember that? So the prophecy is, the Old Testament prophecy is that one day a Redeemer would come. Jesus would show up, and friend, he has come. He has come. And for any of you who are listening by way of the internet or maybe on recording, I want to tell you that in Matthew 11, uh, Jesus said this. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, what's the Sabbath day about? It's about resting. Resting from the work and giving a day to the Lord. And Jesus said that he would give us rest. When we come to the point in our life where we realize, listen closely, I'm closing. When we come to the point in our life where we realize that keeping rules doesn't save anybody, keeping rules won't save a soul, and people who live under Old Testament dictates where they're trying to keep rules in order to be saved, it won't work. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Since I've been saved, I've had rest from my labors of trying to earn salvation. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't earn your salvation. There's one way to be saved, and that's by the work that Jesus did on the cross. No other way. If you decide you're going to be saved and you're going to start coming to church and reading your Bible and you're going to start praying and giving and, and doing all of this stuff to please God, if you're doing it to try to earn salvation, you won't ever be saved. Salvation is free. It's a gift. And the way to get the gift is to receive Jesus. Salvation is in a person. It's not even in a plan. And when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, when someone is willing to repent and turn their way on their old way and turn to Jesus in faith, believing that he died on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sins, then you can have salvation. Believing that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day, Believing that and accepting that, believing in your heart and accepting him as Savior will save your soul. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer?